If you're new to our channel, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. So we're going to go to the Eye of the Organics 31 Plant Guard Hotline and bring in our guest. Master gardener, horticultural ex- educator, media expert, and all-around great guy. On various media platforms, he explains how to grow sustainably and have gardening success through TV, radio, print, presentations, and workshops. He uses gardening and greening to inspire people to get out and grow. William Moss, welcome to the program. And thank you for taking time to join us uh, and our listeners and educating all of us with some of your garden wisdom. Oh man, well, thanks for having me as always. It's always good to hear you guys and be with that. So, uh, spring starting. Let's, let's get going. Uh, what is a degraded forest? You put this up on YouTube the other day. You were, you were in a group of people with cleaning out, I guess, what you call trash trees. What is the importance of, uh, taking care or cleaning one up if you have it in your backyard? Because wouldn't nature just take care of itself? What, what's the significance here? Well, see, you, you would hope that's the case, but that's just not the way it works, especially in uh, suburban or urban areas. Nature sometimes gets off kilt. So, so you have trees that are very invasive, boss cells that are not native and cause a lot of damage to natural habitat. If you're not boss cells, it's born. Um, even native box elders do the same thing. Honeysuckles, uh, twivets, a lot of those bad plants can get in there and they'll completely change the habitat. They'll block out not only your good plants, but they spread into the woods and adjacent areas and just make everything look tangled, overgrown, uh, not what it should be. Not enough openness to have the wildflowers and to have the, have the, have the, have the animals come through. So what you should do is clear everything out. You should clear out all the the overgrowth, all the tangled stuff, it kind of looks, it looks like a big edge a lot of time in people's yards in the summer, so they leave it. You know, it's like a big uh, tangled mass, and they think that's what nature's supposed to be. But actually, it should be much more open. So if you don't know what's bad and what's good, I suggest you get in touch with um, the Botanic Garden locally around your area or the Cooperative Extension Service. So we've got a really good landscape service that you trust. You can talk to them and ask them, you know, is this tree native? What is it doing to the yard? What is this clump of shrubbery in the back doing? So uh, it's, 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 not, it's not simple to do, so, so it's hard for me to put it in a, in a few words. But, but if you can clear the stuff out, you'll notice a tremendous difference in your area, and then you'll be able to bring in plants that you love. Right, and some of these trees that you're talking about are not native to North America. They are, well, they're an, they're an invasive species, and that's kind of somewhat of the reason why we're wanting to uh, remove them. Yes, especially things like buckthorn, which is really aggressive and shading things out. There's also honeysuckle that does this a lot. Multi-floor rows. You can find a lot with privet. Um, those, those, even even burning bushes are not considered to be invasive in many areas. So if you can get those out, you can get a lot of other cool things in. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a proponent. I just want to talk about this coming out soon to Chicago Land Garden and Magazine. Um, I'm a huge proponent of replacing those trees with small fruit trees. If you don't need a big tree, you throw in things like uh, a cherry tree or or like a beach plum, really cool native things that that provide food for you and wildlife, but also um, keep things open and beautiful. Well, that makes sense. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm rambling on because I'm excited. I'm <laughs> more than I will read them this and morning, guys. It I'm, makes I'm, really, I'm about it, to teach a class on vegetables, so, uh, so I'm kind of rambling. So rein me in if you need to. <laughs> okay. That's, no, that's great information. Now, a lot of people say they want to garden. They always fail. They're more of a plant killer than a plant grower. What are some things these people can do to become better plant growers? Okay, first thing is just experiment. You know, don't don't always think of everything as, oh, if I don't do this, I fail. Actually, what you did is you learned less. So at least now you know what not to do next time. <laughs> so, 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 don't think that if it dies, it's always your fault. Sometimes it may have been the plant's fault or just not a good match. So ask the people at the garden center where you're going to buy your plant. Ask them, uh, you know, what plant fits my site, and just keep trying. The more you do this, the better you get at it. And 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 also for people who really think, oh, I can't grow anything. I have a completely dead thumb. Well, then get you some seeds. Seeds are cheap. You can try several things. You can spray.
spread them out and try them, and that way you haven't invested much money into it, and you get a chance to see how plants grow all the way from seed to harvest or from seed to flower, whatever you're picking out. And just being there in that process and going through it, sticking with it through the whole season will teach you so much. So um, experience is the best teacher when it comes to gardening, and failure is a big part of that experience. So don't look at it as being negative. It's just part of the journey. Well, we had Shauna Coronado on the program a couple of years ago, and you're familiar with her, and she said you're not a good yes. gardener unless you've killed about a thousand plants. So, uh, yeah, well, that's that's up back. I, 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 we were talking yesterday with some people from Morton Arbor Reading where I'm at, and I was saying that there's nobody that's killed more plants than me. I will take the claim to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, William, what are some of your favorite vegetables to grow? I know that uh, okra is one of them. You've encouraged us of to course. grow that here, and we were successful with that here in Zone 5 in the Milwaukee area. What are some that you enjoy growing that, that you're like your go to's that may maybe you know uncommon to others so with by that this morning and, it's, it's, and uh, my number one actually is the mossy winner of year as performance is cheese pumpkin uh, it is it's, I, I just love to grow the plant because it, it covers a summer through fall with so many changes first you have these big beautiful leaves and then cheese pumpkin the leaves are modeled so you have these beautiful pumpkin leaves that have model colors and markings all along them they can be as, as, as wide as a dinner plate bigger big as a charger and then you have um the flowers to come out, and the flowers can be six to eight inches across. Now, some people eat the flowers. I recommend only eating the males, but the females produce pumpkins, which start to develop right after that. And then you have these big, huge pumpkins that you can harvest all through late summer, going through fall into the frost. And cheese pumpkins are actually butternut squash that are flattened out. So they're not like jack o' lantern pumpkins. Uh, so it's like a big, squat butternut squash. And it'll keep for like two years. If you keep in the right conditions, and it's delicious. We make these beautiful pies out of them. And I'm telling you, Joey, if you can taste this, these cheese pumpkin muffins, you'll be a convert too. So cheese pumpkins are my favorite vegetable to go that most people don't grow. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Now, just want to re- let everyone know we're talking with Master Gardener, horticulture educator, media expert, William Moss. What are some of your major no-nos you see gardeners do early in the spring that they should not be doing? Um, a long time ago, I used to till my garden up, and I found from experience that the more you till, the more weeds you, you, you'll have that year. And also, you destroy the soil structure. Lots of plants, especially a lot of the greens that we grow, the broccoli and even the okra, like a natural soil structure. So I'd say that tilling is probably one of the biggest mistakes that I see people do. Now, if you're a new gardener in a new space, I understand, but if you've been gardening in that same space for a few years, um, rather than chilling, I'm much better do like you guys do and just put down compost on top of the bed. And now you can pull that compost back when you plant your seeds. But killing it just exposes so many weed trees. I just, that's probably the biggest mistake they make. And then over fertilization. Uh, I see it all the time. You don't need to fertilize so much in the beginning. And then people forget to switch over and use less nitrogen in the summertime when plants are trying to flower. You know, you want to use heavy nitrogen early um, if you want to use it at all you know, for the plants to get green, but once they start their flowering and fruiting stage, you can ease back on that. And that's one of the reasons people have a lot of pests, especially in the late summer, because they're over-fertilizing, and the aphids speak out that nitrogen. All that extra nitrogen you give in the plant, all that rank growth is coming up, it's just calling aphids to it. So over-fertilization, killing are probably the two biggest things that I see in the early spring. Now, we get this question, I see this question a lot on uh, garden uh, plants, platforms or, or Facebook. Uh, I want to build raised beds, but I want to do it as cheaply as possible. Now, William, you know, just like we know, you get what you're paid for. What What is the yep. best way that we can people can, to, can put a raised bed in, but do it for affordably? But when people say cheap, I'm thinking they're not going to have a good result at the end if they go the cheap route. I, yeah, yeah, I think so too. And you know, I, I've seen I've seen photos of you guys' beds, and you know, your beds are your beds are nice. And sometimes you got to put a little more into it to get out what you want. So if you're trying to do it for like under twenty dollars or under thirty dollars, you can get a kit. But those kits are usually smaller and sometimes flimsy. I find the best way to do it is if you're going to, if you're going to stay low, is you can you do it with cinder block, or if you're a builder or, or, or like to play with tools like I do, you can build 
day and I choose four by six wood. You can use you can build a six inch bed, which is three um four four by six by eight long posts. So so for a cost of one post may cost I think fifteen bucks. So for like forty five, fifty bucks you can build a six inch high bed. It's gonna be four foot long and eight and eight feet wide. So you can have a nice size bed fairly cheap, but then you gotta have the tools to build. Uh it's not a kit. Like, like I said, you can get the kits but uh, but they're not as good as building this yourself. I always prefer to build a raised bed because they last so much longer. If let me just tell you the story. I, I built raised beds for my mother in law's house. I call her my mom in Chicago back in nineteen ninety eight. Out of or out of uh, three boards, they're still there today. Still sturdy, still producing sun chokes, just like you guys. Sun chokes, still producing carrots and tomatoes. So if you build it out of the right material, it actually will be cheap because it'll last longer. You won't have to replace it. Right, just like anything in life, you put the investment in, you do it right with the right materials, and the reward will continue to pay you back year after year. Let me address the materials really quick. Yes, go ahead. Some people are concerned about what chemicals made the inside of the wood. Everything that's currently being used has been approved by the FDA. Now you take that with a grain of salt because that's things that happened before. So if you if you really want to be sure that the wood you have isn't going to leach any sort of chemicals, look for either some sort of sustainable grown wood that has not been treated, or go with cedar. And because cedar does not have to be treated, and it won't leak any um, chemicals into the soil because they don't have to treat it with any chemicals. So those, those are the two types of boards where, where you want to be sure there's nothing coming into it. But um, all wood now that's slated for outdoor use um, is, is, is supposedly safe. Yeah. yeah, fantastic. Well, we really have enjoyed having you on, on the program. How can we find out more about you and where to find you? Well, you can always go to get out and grow dot org. Right now, we love people to come and sign up and uh, you know register for the mailing list and um, join me next week. I'll be down at Chicago Flower and Garden Show all week doing their potting parties four times a day. I love people to come down. We, we have a new thing this year where we're telling stories with our pots and we're planting perennials that are going to last from year to year, and so people will have a little patch of their garden to tell a story about. Uh, you know, so and uh, also on Facebook. You know, you guys are Facebook superstars. I'm, you know, I'm trying to get into it myself. So check me out on Facebook at William Moss TV, uh, or either at Get Out and Grow. Well, William, we greatly appreciate you taking time out of your day uh, to join us and educate Holly, and myself, and all of our listeners about more gardening information that we, than what we're uh, able to cover on the program. Thank you guys so much. I look forward to coming back and chatting with you. Absolutely. For more information, please visit the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com.